Hi everyone, I am Mara Webster from SAG After Foundation and uh, we are continuing our conversations at Home Series today with the wonderful Vince Wilburn Jr. and Aaron Davis who managed the Miles Davis estate are also producers on Miles Davis, Birth of the Cool and also are incredibly talented musicians who toured with him for a number of years and I'm so thrilled that you guys are both joining us here today. How have you been through all of this so far? Well, thanks for having us. Uh, this is Aaron. Uh, I, I've been okay. It's been a little strange having my kids home all the time. Uh, and I just keep thinking about everybody out there who's, uh, who's missing out on work and it's just, you know, people getting sick. And my friend's father passed away yesterday or the other day. He had, he, he got the virus. Uh, so sorry to hear that. It's been How about you, Vince? How's it all been so far? Um, you know, just coping and dealing with it and, and, and um, trying to stay upbeat and positive. Yeah. And um, it's a good time to make music. So that's what I'm doing, creating music. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, because you're actually... And eating right, you know, organically, you know. Because so. you're actually in your studio right now. So how, how have both of you been managing to create music and remain creative in amongst not being able to be in the room with people in the same way? Well, uh, for me, it's all through the magic of, of UPS. <laughs> I'm still able to, uh, to get the stuff I need in my, in my room and, uh, you know, all the parts and stuff. I've been just like taking care of all the old projects that have just been sitting around. So, and then making music, you know, trying not to bother my neighbors too much. <laughs> you know, I've got to get some beats in there. Um, I was just wondering how you set about navigating who would be the right voice to, to direct and tell Miles Davis's story oh, through the oh. documentary and how you ultimately landed on Stanley Nelson being the right person for that. Well, we met with Stanley um, a while back, I think right before Miles Ahead, right, Cuz? Yeah. Around that time. And, and so he circled back as our publicist likes to say. And we met with him again after miles ahead. And we, 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 as a family felt that he was, you know, the, 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 the vibe was right. The energy was right. And, and, and one of the things that stood out for me is that he didn't want to sugarcoat or he, you know, or, or paint. He wanted to, he wanted to open it up. He said, bell, he's bells and whistles, you know, something to that nature. Um, of of what made Miles Davis Miles Davis, warts you know? and all, warts and all. <laughs> so you know, so that that was that was pretty pretty um, that was pretty like that was that was like my my sign off, you know. And and cousin I met after the meeting, and you know we felt like let let's roll because we didn't know what you know we did it was all in Stanley's hands after we did the uh, the meeting the initial meeting, so. We trusted him. Did he come to you both at all? Because obviously, since you're both managing the Miles Davis estate and, and all of the image and the use of, of his music and making sure it's used in the right way, did Stanley connect with you both at all in terms of the usage of archival material and which songs he was going to pull into the film? Did you know anything about that side of things? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. He's like, uh, once we signed off, right, cuz? Yeah. That was it. You know? Uh, but but he, was, he was really cool about... about he would reach out to us if he needed certain things, you know? But I, if, I, if I may say so, I think that Aaron and I, and Aaron can chime in on this, we trusted him, you know? Oh yeah, definitely, yeah. And so when you, you know, we didn't know, we didn't see anything. We weren't privy to each other's interviews. I couldn't go to Aaron's interview or Quincy Jones or Herbie's or Aaron couldn't come to mind. I think Aaron did his in New York, yeah. but, but it was a trust factor. And so we didn't see anything to the night before we were, we were going to Sundance and he sent us the link. The three of us, Cheryl, Cheryl Davis is my cousin, Aaron's sister is, is, is part of Miles Davis properties. So he sent the three of us the link. What was that experience like watching it for, for the first time and just revisiting so many of those moments and so many of those stories? You go first, Aaron. No, no, you guys. Okay. All right. Well, for me, uh, you know, it was emotional. You know, I watched it in my studio and then I came to the main house and I was pretty emotional and I was like, wow, man, Stanley really knocked it out, you know? And, you know, I, I told my wife, I'm like, man, it's really cool. I can't wait for you to see it. Uh, yeah. 
and you know that, that that's me. <laughs> it, it came in late at night, right? Because about 10, 30, 11, maybe yeah. a little later, maybe. And yeah. so it's a two-hour film, and I watched it personally, and I cried. Then I pick up the phone and call Stanley, which is like what five in the morning, four or five in the morning in New York, where he lives. And I'm crying and I'm like, Stanley, it's so amazing. And so, you know, so he picks up the phone, says thanks, and hangs up. He's like, I'm asleep. I'm asleep and hangs up. <laughs> but, you know, we joke about it now, but he was really touched that we, we loved it. You know, we, we, we uh, you know, we uh, gave, you know, it was, it was amazing. And then yeah. we flew to Sundance and then we, and see, Aaron and I have flown all over the world to promote the, the documentary. And so you have different reactions all over the world, and, and it's something to 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 witness. You know, we've been to South Africa, to, to Berlin, to where all over the states, right, Cuz? Yeah, yeah. Um, London. We, we went to Toronto, London, uh, San Francisco, uh, uh, Dallas, St. Louis, New Orleans. It was a great year. <laughs> it was great. We went to New York a couple of times. That's what gorgeous. were some of those differences in the way that people were responding to it? Oh, it's just like some certain jokes would be funnier to certain audiences or, uh, you know, like certain facts or like, you know, revelations were more interesting to people. You know, like I found like the audience in Cape Town and in South Africa really was just soaking the whole thing up. Like everything was like, like everything was important. You know, every little thing was funny, you know. Yeah. And uh, then, and then, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Go, ahead. go ahead. No, no, no. You're right, cuz. And then, and then, and then in, in Soweto, the next night or then a few nights later, it was like a a, a makeshift theater, <laughs> and it was raining, and this and this this the sky was showing the documentary on his laptop, and it kept glitching and turning off, <laughs> but everybody stayed, and then the, the South African musicians were all in tears, yeah. you know, so that was like something to behold, you know, and and it was emotional for for us. You know, and and they did one in Harlem, and 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 African Americans were talking back to the screen, like "Go, Miles!" Like Miles was a superhero, <laughs> you know. So that was kind of cool too, you know. Yeah. That's it such was, an amazing experience to have had with the film in all those different ways and in each. Yeah, movie. yeah, you know. Was yeah. there anything in um, in interviews and anecdotes and stories that people were were telling about Miles? through the film, were there any anecdotes that people told that made it into the cut that you hadn't maybe heard before or sides of him that you saw differently from other people's perspectives of him? There were certain things like when Corky, his, his friend, um, oh, McCoy, Corky McCoy, uh, he was talking about um, when, when, he was, when he was getting himself back together and getting healthy after his uh, sort of brief semi-retirement um he he was talking about um taking him he's like he, you know sicily had him eating vegetables and juice and stuff and he was like you gotta take me with somewhere where they got some meat so i can just smell the smells you know <laughs> like i didn't know he you know like just hearing that kind of stuff and you know those are the kind of stories we would always hear from him but about other people you know like other like like bird or something like that, right, Vince? And, yeah, yeah, and it was cool. It's cuz you call me Vince. Oh, we're on screen, with Vince. <laughs> <laughs> no, we call each other cuz. But and then and then to 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 add on to that, cuz um, remember when when the, the clothes changed and, and yeah, yeah, and mm -hmm. Jimmy Cobb, a brilliant drummer, our hero, played on Kind of Blue, said that then he started wearing all these funny looking outfits. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for the suits. All these funny looking suits, you know. Yeah, yeah. And then when Wayne would say, you know, it's like what his friends would say, you know, about him, about Uncle Miles. It was pretty cool, you know. Yeah. I actually wanted to ask you both about the role of, of running and managing his estate because I think it's something that a lot of people know very little about what that actually entails. So I was curious about what some of the aspects are that you end up dealing with that that we don't really know about on the other side of things. And, and particularly because the music industry in particular has changed so rapidly and so much over the time that you've been doing this role. Right, right, you're right, yeah. <laughs> it's changed a lot. Um, yeah, when we started there, we were still be able to get CDs uh, from Tower Records down the street, you know. But, um, 
you know, some of the stuff we do is like we have to kind of police the bootlegs, especially of the merchandise, you know, music and merchandise and image and likeness. And, you know, uh, we have to, you know, we have to review license requests, which come in every day from uh, music to, again, image and likeness. And, uh, and you know, like Vince, Vince, Vince he can tell you, like, yeah, I mean, he, he, he's got his fingers in like all kinds of stuff. He's trying to like, you know, do for the estate or just like trying to open up new doors and avenues. It's like, it's, it's kind of a different type of job, right? Man? Yeah. 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 And, 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 and the beautiful thing about it is Aaron and I bounce off of each other. You know, it's like, if I miss something, Aaron's on it. If Aaron misses something, I'm on it. And, and it works in tandem. And, you know, from merch to Aaron's ideals on merch to, to artists I would never think would love Uncle Miles and they contact Aaron, right? And I'm like, dang, Aaron, that guy loves Chief. We call him Chief. And and then people reach out to us, you know, and then all of the all of the musicians from all the different um styles of music are, are giving us love and, and 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 talking about how much they love the music, how much they love Miles. You know, I didn't say loved, but love. And and everybody we reach out to to maybe do a collaboration with everybody's like, yeah, they don't never say, well, call my lawyer or, or this is my <laughs> fee. You know, we just found out Nas dug the documentary, uh, um, Q-Tips working on a project. It's, you know, we don't want to let the, the uh, cat out of the bag, but it's like, it's, it's, a, we've got some, some really great things cooking up and, and Aaron and I talk two or three times a day, if not text two or three times a day with the, yeah. with the, with the lawyers and the merch people, you know, the team, and and the uh, publicists to to um to um to keep to keep you know keep miles global. Yeah, and it's fun. It's fun. Well, that's a great job, man. Yeah. I mean, I love what you were talking about just now in terms of the way that you're molding, melding his music into other genres. And that feels like such a natural and beautiful tribute to him because that was what he did with his music anyway. He was always experimenting and bringing different styles of music together. So what was the point at which you first realized that that was going to be a really important part of this that needed to happen with his music? Well, well you know, the, the music speaks for itself. So it's not like, we're trying to trying to trying to to force anything, you know. We did a special screening for the Rolling Stones with just Aaron and I, and that was like, you know, and they, they we, no no you know no outside public just just us at the at the um at the uh, what was it called? Soho at the Soho House in Chicago. I mean, you know, Aaron's tight with the guys from Metallica. I mean, it's 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 you know, it's just it's it's wild. It it amazes me how how this one man with the trumpet from, from Alton, Illinois, continues to touch the world. And I don't want to sound too sappy about it, but it's a fact, you know? Mm. Right, yes. cuz? Yeah, definitely, yeah. I mean, you know, like, uh, back to your question, the, the, mu the, 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 the music and going into different genres and things, you know, like, I... I, I we realized early on that that had to be, you know, part yeah. of it. Like, we wanted people to like want to collaborate with his tracks yeah. and his uh, the different periods. And you know, I mean, I've heard we've heard guys like Americo Gazaway like chop up Birds of the Cool. We've heard, you know, uh, you know, there was a point where Thievery Corporation was interested in working on doing some kind of kind of blue thing, which I thought was a little like I really loved them, but at the same time, I was like, I don't know if that's gonna work. But we decided to give them a chance anyway. It just never really happened. But, uh, you know, there's various different projects, you know, going on now and in the past that, you know, always involve someone coming and collaborating. So it's kind of, you know, it's really cool. Like even the Everything's Beautiful uh, record that we put out a couple of years ago with uh, Robert Glasper and uh, Hiatus Coyote and Bilal and all these great, um, you know, King and all these great acts, you know. Yeah, so, yeah, you know, the, the collaboration going forward is always going to be important. Yeah. Evolution of the Groove with Nas and Santana. I mean, yeah. it's, you know, it's, it's amazing. It also seems like it must be such a monumental task to have to look at, you know, over 50 years of, of music and hundreds of recordings. So how do you navigate setting out to make sure that you're really getting his music out there, not just the really well-known stuff, but kind of introducing new audiences to some of the, the lesser known albums and, and songs that he recorded over the years? Well, we just, we, we work with, with 
schools who hold the masters to, you know, to, to try to bring people music. They have, you know, as much as, as, as trying to keep people informed of what, what has, what has come out in the past and how the genres changed and how the music evolved over time. We still want to be able to give people music they haven't heard. And there is a lot of stuff out there. There's a lot of live stuff. There's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of stuff from the studios, but you know, I, I, we just try to keep it. We try not to just repackage everything. We try to like give them new things like our bootleg series with Sony. That's been really successful because it's, it's live concerts with bands that some, in one case, there was a band that hadn't actually recorded a record, but they did record some live stuff together that he had, you know, a certain lineup. So, like, you know, people were really interested in that, you know, and, and it was killing. <laughs> it's killing. Yeah, yeah, correct. And as long as the, 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 the demand is there, we'll keep, we'll keep, you know, tastefully releasing cool things, you know, yeah. cool yeah. music. It's, a, it's, it's tons of music in the vaults, so... I also wanted to talk a little bit about the time that both of you spent as musicians playing on stage with him, because I imagine that must have been such a, an incredible experience. And Aaron, I know that you started going out on tour with him and when you were 14 during the summers and that yeah. he had you kind of doing behind the stage roadie stuff to begin with. What were some of the really valuable things that you learned from just observing behind the scenes that really served you once you set foot on stage for that first time? Well, I mean, the fortunate thing for me was I, I was a roadie in his band for like four or five tours. And I got to learn how, how he ran the show, basically, or how the show worked, you know, uh, as far as uh, visual cues. You know, Vince, when Vince was a drummer, he was always watching Chief, you know, the whole time during the set. You know, I see how he cue in the other musicians to their solos, Kenny Garrett, Bob Berg, John Schofield, Mike Stern, whoever it was, you know, Daryl Jones, uh, Richard Patterson, you know, Kay Akagi, Bobby Irving, all these great musicians, Adam Holtzman. And, um, you know, I, I just kind of learned what, what, what it's like to be on the, at the top level of, of a live touring act, you know, as, as far as music, musicianship and as far as, uh, you know, um, executing, you know, what, what Miles's idea was, you know, and, and by the time he asked me to be in the band, I was, I really fit right in. I just was nervous all the time. <laughs> and for you, Vince, what was that feeling the first time that you played on stage with him? And what were, what were some of the things that you really remember just learning and taking away from that first experience? Well, it happened so fast. You know, you don't have you don't you don't have enough time to be nervous. You're just ready, like my like Cuz said. Um, the first live concert I played was the Long Beach Jazz Festival. And on the side of the stage, you probably don't know who these drummers are, or you may know. It's Jack DeJanet, Dave Weckl, Freddie White from Earth, Wind, and Fire, and a couple of other guys. I was too nervous to even look to the to the side of the stage, right? <laughs> Outdoors is cold, and and you and Uncle Miles would have always told us to keep our eyes wherever he was on stage with the wireless trumpet to never you know you know always because he, he was in directing you know so I didn't have time to think about who was on the side of the stage what drummers were there just that we're starting to, starting the concert let's go so after the first night the tour started and that was it. You know, and then after the show, he said how great I sounded, which was like, over. he called my mom, you know, I was like, wow, you know. <laughs> but but with, with Uncle Miles, and, and, and Aaron can attest to this, you don't have, you know, you, you got to be ready, you know, you got to be ready. You know, what are we going to say? No, Chief, we're not ready? Uh, no, we can't, we don't. We'll, take, we'll do the next tour. <laughs> no, you know, he said, you ready? And then we hit, right, cuz? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And it's I, fun. It's fun. It's fun. I also read that he would completely continue changing songs throughout a tour so that a song would start one way and by the end of the tour, with it changing just a little bit every night, that it would be something totally different by the end. So how did that challenge you in, in new and unique ways as musicians? And how does that still influence the way that you both work to this day? <laughs> You go first, Chris. Well, for me, you know, it really kind of solidified this idea that I had younger when I when I would go see bands 
and I would compare their live performance to the record. And I'd say, oh, that was cool. They added something to it or, you know, they stripped it down or whatever. With him, it was like, you can do all that and like change everything if you want. You can change the tempo, you can change the groove, you can change, you know, the, the, whatever, the solos around. <laughs> you can change solo sections. Like it didn't matter. It was just like an organic thing. There was one piece of music that he just called it the blues. He said, play the blues. It was like usually the second or third song in the set. And that, oh, he, he played that probably every night, every show I saw him play. But it was different all the time. It was like sometimes it was up tempo, sometimes it was really down tempo, sometimes it was like sparse. Sometimes like the whole band was playing it a lot more. It was much more lively blues. Like it was, I think. But I think that was one of the pieces of music for him that he liked to toy with. You know, it didn't have to sound like anything. It could just be whatever it was that night. And, and I think that's cool. I don't think a lot of people have that. You know, uh, that, that's original to me. Cool, no, and, and, and the way he, he had a, a uncanny way of, um, like Aaron said, you know, just switching up. I mean, if, the, if, if, if we were playing one song and he would cut it off cause, and then move to the next one. He had this, this, this knack for knowing what was going on in the connection with the audience and what was going on on stage. And then he recorded everything, everything live. So at the end of the night, he'd have us come up to his, um, room and he, he, he would tell us what to work on, what to critique. I mean, he would critique us on. And then the next night he'd, he'd switch up, maybe switch up the uh, set list, you know, which was cool, which was amazing, you know? I also love the way that when he was playing as a musician, he would actually also often turn around and face, face you all as the band. So there was that real connectivity on stage, which, which feels like it must have been really important for the evolution of songs as they were happening each night. But, but what was that unique connection like on stage those nights that, that's different to performing with anyone else? I mean, there's nothing else like that. There's nothing, there was nothing else for me to let, ever like that. And I, and I tell bands that I've worked with in the past, whether I'm in the band or I'm helping them, you know, produce something for them. Like, you guys got to look at each other when you're playing to make sure you can all hear each other. You know, like, you guys got to – don't just play the parts like they were written. Like, you got to look at each other, and it's got to move together, and it's got to be eye contact. And then there's – humor starts to develop in the music and stuff like that. So that it's, you know, it's priceless, you know. You know what? Um – Cause you were like looking under the symbols. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He used to, you know, like a conductor when he conducts the, an orchestra, he has his he faces the 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 uh, musicians, right? Um, we love the interaction of him, like messing with us, or or you know, he would talk about what we had on, or but it was always he was always serious about the music. But I think he had a, 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 a another uh, he zoned in on. If we were nervous, if, he, if musicians were nervous or relaxed, and he wanted to keep us on, on that edge, you know. So the connection of messing with you or, or winking at you or blowing you a kiss or <laughs> shutting the band down and going to the next song, you know, all that, you know, that, that's what we cherished, you know, because it, it, it's, it's, it's like a, you know, it's like a being, it's like a coach, you know, you know, like, passing you the ball with that, that, that dunk, that super dunk or that amazing dunk. And that smile he would give us when, you, when, you, when you're giving him what he wants, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It's incredible, incredible. Yeah. Also, one of the, one of the things that the documentary brings up is, is when he did take that semi-retirement that you were mentioning earlier and, and him just feeling very creatively burned out, which I think is something that, that it honestly happens to all of us at certain points in, in creative endeavors. And I was curious as to what you both do for yourselves to, to try and avoid getting to that point, or if you start to feel that burnout coming, what you do to rejuvenate yourselves artistically. And I wish I, wish I could get to creative burnout right now. I, I'm like running a homeschool over here. <laughs> My wife and I, we're running a homeschool uh, daycare in here. Um, and every time I get to the garage to start practicing, somebody's coming to the door, knocking on the door. <laughs> but I mean, I mean, I, I actually take long breaks. Like, to be honest, I take, I mean, I take years off from playing sometimes and I don't really like that. 
But in, when I come back, I am creatively sparked again. You know, like I, I don't really, I don't, I'm going to try to not do that again, but it, it has helped me creatively. It's just that I, it takes me, you know, almost a year for my chops to all come back to where I need them to be, you know. What about you, Cuz? I'm, I'm ready right now. I'm ready to go on tour. <laughs> Burnout, I'm not there yet. You know, I'm ready to play always, yeah. you know. And, and, and if I get complacent or if I get bored, then I, I'm, I'm listening to something, a new artist or something like, that's cutting edge. Or I'll call Cuz and say, hey, Cuz. Well, you know, or he'll send me like a YouTube of this new band or something, you know. And that keeps me um, vigorated, right? Yeah. That's not the word? <laughs> Invigorated. You know, it keeps me, keeps me pop, pop, you know, pumped up. You know, and then all these young drummers coming up, shit, you know, you got to be ready. You know, young musicians on my tail. <laughs> you know, and, and, and I, I talked to Thundercat and, and, and Flying Lotus and all those dudes. And Ron Bruno Jr., all these guys, Terrence Martin. You know, these cats are... And, and I played, you know, Kamasi was in my band, Kamasi Washington, a little local band. So, you know, I would, I would imagine that's what, what kept Uncle Miles, you know, um, um, you know um, um, his evolution, because he had young cats around him, you know? And, and he was always checking out young musicians and young artists and, and trying to shape the music, change the music, you know? Never, never, never rested on his laurels. No. I think that rubbed off on Aaron and Cousin and I. I need to get some laurels, and then I'll and then I won't rest on. I'll just move now, right past. Now, this laurels. is for the public. My cousin will play guitar and call me, and 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 it'd be killing. Then he get on the drums, and it'd be killing. And I, my jaw, my mouth would be wide open, and then he hang. He say, "I'll call you later," and I'm like, "What? You know, it's in his DNA. It's in our DNA. You know, I hate to put him on blast, but." You know, we 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 would we we would never really 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 have burnout. I pray, you know. You know, I, I would love to get to that point. <laughs> I would love to get to. That. I've done all I can do for you people. I'm done. No, I, no, I, I, I think no, we'll I mean, make music for the rest of our life. If I had gone through what he went through with all those bands and those styles and the times he had to go through them, yeah, yeah. starting in the in the. 40s and the, you know even the 30s even yeah I don't, I'm just saying I would have been burned out way before that I, like we would have had a couple of pauses in that if that was my career <laughs> yeah. I mean I, I I you know he was he was creatively exhausted and physically you know in a lot of pain with his hip and his you know so you would always, yeah so you know I. I I would never he, begrudge him that. I just, I knew it was a tough time for him. You know? But he would always revive himself, right? Because always come yeah, back. Yeah, I mean, he didn't, didn't want to be doing all that. He, you know, he would have rather been pushing it further, but I think he needed a break. And he, he, I, he was kind of forced into one, in a way. You know? Given that you're both in, in positions now where you're essentially in these leadership positions in terms of creating film scores, leading bands, working with bands. Um, what's really important to you in terms of the work ethic and creative environment that you want to in instill in that space, in that position? Say it again, uh, one more time. So essentially kind of like what's, what's the work ethic and, and creative environment that you'd like to create for the musicians that you're working with since uh, they're taking their lead from, from both of you? I mean, for for me, that's like one of the greatest gifts I got from from Miles and Vince. You know, was was you know, it's it's one thing to do it, to do it where you hire everybody to play exactly what you want them to play, and that you know, like, you know, maybe that's necessary for your particular act or, or you know, particular artist. But I like being able to get people in who can, you know, bring something to what you've done already. Perhaps like you, maybe you have spent two years making this record, but you really want to hire everyone to play it exactly like you you did it? Maybe you do, but maybe you want to get some guys or some players and just kind of like see how they play it. And, and you know, you picked – like the way the thing Miles did was he picked somebody that he thought would fit into the sound that he was trying to create. So whether you knew who that person was, whether you had heard of them or not, whether you liked them or not, it didn't matter because he thought that he heard something that, that would work with, with what he was trying to do. 
And I think, I think that's a great gift you can give to a musician who's trying to start their own band or how to, how to work something. It's like the collaborative effort and how to pick people that you think would work in that particular environment. Mm -hmm. yeah, 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 true, true. I, I like picking musicians and sharing with musicians that I could share things with and learn from, you know? I um, had a kid named Mono Neon on bass. He, he, was, he was Prince's last bass player. So he toured with us. And now this kid's got like 200,000, 250,000 viewers on his Instagram page. <laughs> Not because of me, but because he, he had something to offer and something to say. And I checked him and then he took it, you know, he took his, he launched his thing, you know? So that's when I try, I try to attract uh, musicians like Mono Neon and, and Brandon Coleman and all these guys. And Tomasi. then share what I know, huh? Kamasi. Kamasi, you know, and then share what I know and then, and, and still learn. And, 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 and I don't want to say teach, but I'd rather use the word share, you know? And, and, and that's what we do. We pass it on. Chief left this for us. And then we, we, we're, we're like sponges, Aaron and I. So we can never stop sharing and learning and creating and, 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 and giving back, you know? That's exciting. I don't want to. Be, I don't want our band to be called a tribute band because yeah. we're not a tribute band. You know, we love Uncle Miles. We love the music of Miles Davis, but it's the music. It's our interpretation of this great music. We'll never be Herbie Hancock, Tony Williams, Jack DeJohnette, those great musicians. But it's our love and interpretation of the music. And now what we're trying to do is is play um, um, other music. You know, in the in 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 the uh, spirit of. You know, and I'm calling Aaron and he's playing some, you know, acoustic guitar. And I'm like, what? We were going to um, <laughs> the Image Awards and he was just playing acoustic guitar. And I'm like, wow, you know, like I wanted to call John Mayer and say, watch out. <laughs> you know? Yeah, right. <laughs> but, but I mean, I mean, th th that's the kind of, you know, and drums, he's he playing his butt off on drums. So that's the kind of thing we have. Uh, uh, we're like brothers and we're, and we're always trying to 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 um to move to move our, our careers and 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 put the and, and keep the chief out there you know it's exciting I sound so excited right <laughs> well thank you so much it's been so genuinely fascinating and wonderful to hear you know not just about the work that you're doing to to honor Miles through the film and other avenues but also just about your own work and and approach as musicians so thank you for taking the time today and I hope that everyone watching will check out Miles Davis Birth of the Cool on on Netflix following this thank you oh yeah thank you so much well, thank, thank you thank you thank you bye amazing <laughs>